Hello everyone. This is lecture nine on the courses of nonlinear polymerology published by Wiley. Today we'll finish the discussion of wall slip and move on to the next chapter, which is chapter seven, starting to discuss the nature of yielding. So let me try to uh, still bring home. I, I didn't get very good reactions last time from you about need to okay. try to, um, to understand that maximum. So uh, so let's we are still within 2.2 uh, 6.2 we had a in fact one of the plays to do this this and this and let me just, uh, I always, uh, well, at least, I, I prefer to always give you the conceptual uh, understanding rather than the math, mathematics, which, by the way, doesn't go beyond simple algebra, okay? So, <laughs> so we're really not, uh, we shouldn't really sweat over, over anything, but this is the image. Uh, let me first, uh, indicate to you that when you uh, do the stress model, remember in simple shear, uh, if, you, if you're in, a, in the stress mode, uh, we showed that there will be a shear rate or something beyond, sorry, there will be a critical stress beyond which or something jumps. Uh, Roughly speaking, below the stress, we can say there was no, no slip at all. So, so for example, at this point, for example, at this point, this zero slip velocity, right, at this point. And let's say that's this point, which means it's the critical stress at which things will happen. Just barely above it, boom, it goes. Okay. It's a very sharp first order transition. So, of course, you know what to do. So the shear rate. So the shear rate, of course. Sorry. So the shear rate here is, of course, the stress divided by viscosity at that point, and that's the shear rate. And last time I claim, I indicated to you that this occurs at about a third of the plateau mantle. Which really means this point for monotis per sample is really Newtonian. Which means this is a zero shear viscosity. Everything is linearly related. And I argue that this point essentially is on the order of one over tau, giving you a situation that in the bulk the material is being sheared around this kind, around this condition. Okay? So now imagine this transition. Sure, it is stress control. Therefore, you have the ability not to be stuck. The upper surface is free to go, and all of a sudden, you uh, you to right a ten. Let me just let me just be arbitrary. Uh, in terms of what I do, so I will draw the same slope. All of a sudden, you achieve this max. I draw it very carefully because this slope is the same as the slope there. Yeah, and that's the first figure. That's why you have no change in stress. Yeah, it's the same stress. Yeah? Oh, Lord. It's the same stress because I'm describing this point. Thomas, you have trouble? Can you see it? I really thought you can see the screen well. Okay.
this is control stress, right? And there is a critical stress at which all sudden it slips. Sorry, this is SST, right? Stick slip transition, so called. Involving a essentially the same stress. If it's involving the same stress, of course it's involving the same shear rate in the bulk. Yeah? This is either too simple or <laughs> or, or I bought um, or or you know Alex, you have I think you're, you're touching many points. First of all, I claim that for monolith dispersed sample, this point is new. Yeah. yeah. Secondly, let me rephrase the question a little bit. Okay. Suppose it's a wonderful question. Suppose it's not monolith dispersed. All right. Okay. I told you not being monolith dispersed has just a tiny confusion, not too much. What it means not being uh, uh, mon uh, monolith dispersed. Let me first say, when it's monodispersed, the relation between them is one. It's double log, slope of one. Yes. Let me give you a scenario where it's not inclined. In other words, it's polydispersed. It will follow this blue line, yeah? Slope, slope will be higher. Oops, why did it? Just because I touched a different part of the graphic. Yeah, in any case, the, the blue one, yeah? It will be a, because I live with it, so I, you just trust me, a higher point dispersity would mean the slope is deeper, steeper. Okay? Then, at sigma c, it's not in total. Your thinking already is there. Okay? Uh, 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 Alex, yet this whole concept is still completely uh, valid. It is still going to, this two point of lore, this two point is still going to correspond to the same bulk here. This is it. Because it involves the same stress. So who cares that stress is big as this or not? Which of course is the general expression including shear thing. Okay. Anything? Oh, I also need to explain. So, this magic of a, a, a stress mode give you the freedom for the upper plate to choose whatever speed, such that again, I, we're doing it only in steady state science. I'm omitting all the transcend that we are going to focus for the rest of the whole course. We'll focus on transcend. It's all about transcend. But imagine I manage that and we're talking about steady state. Okay? In the steady state, uh, th this, is, this is the only scenario that can be. Uh, it, it will attend, instead of V, no slip. Will attend the maximum V. Uh, corresponding to the jump. And uh, w without, you know, without without the bulk being sheared differently. Right? So uh, as I said, uh, the, the the your 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 upper plate is not what you dictate, it only dictates how much force you apply. So the material just choose to go to a place such that my bulk will attend the same stress. That's all it is, right? So now you can appreciate between zero and this is a possibly a whole range. That becomes accessible when you use rate control.
and it has and this is what I was trying to do in red mode. Help me, help me, where's uh, no slip here. Slip a little bit all the way to the point of slipping. This, this is where the SST is. So you have a full range in between. And this uh, uh, really uh, give you the conceptual point about uh, the need to discuss this point. What is this point? This is the maximum amount of slip when your material still have the ability to avoid going higher in rate in the bulk. If I further increase the rate, uh, the, the upper speed, as you experimentalists can control using rate, uh, rate mode, then, uh, then there will be a point that, uh, that the bulk start to become sheared more than this, this marginal state. So that's all expressed here. This is just the apparent rate. Uh, this is uh, this is an amount of one. I can told you in the notes. As you explore this, the speed goes from, of course, zero to the maximum that I offer you. And by the time it is maximum, this is the minimum W. When WI is beyond this value, it causes more slip to nonlinear bulk. Uh, it doesn't let me under uh, sort of all nonlinear. It's very critical. We ex experimentalists want to know. Under what condition my bulk start to be sheared in, in my uh, notational I was very careful with that. So we call this apparent. Apparent meaning you experimentalist. Sorry. Sorry. You experimentalist thought what you have, which is V over H time. Because of the ability to slip, the bulk never reaches uh, WI, which is this number, around one, until you exceed this net value. Because at that point, your B has uh, become maximum, and beyond that, you have to, uh, uh, beyond that is when the system uh, start to respond with, uh, uh, with a slope higher than the uh, Gamma C. So th this is practically extremely important because ultimately the whole story of nonlinear column rheology, there are two, as usual, I, I, I was a bit too quick not to mention. In, remember, we are, we are trying to provide guidance for processing. In processing, Usually, it's a more complicated geometry, but literally, you can boil down. The, the processing essentially involves two major modes of deformation. One is shear, one is extension. We'll speak about them separately, and we'll, I will inject lots of interesting comments on this. But for, uh, for, for, for shear, uh, For shear, if you want to understand the nonlinear aspect of shear, in other words, strong shear condition, you can see there's no way out but to first being able to handle what happens with worst slip. In other words, if worst slip is something you could not account for its correction, you cannot proceed to look at the uh, nonlinear response in the bulk because I just indicate to you, up to this point, 
all the response is only slip. Uh, so this, uh, I think intuitively it's very straightforward. The, the, the system simply, when you apply higher and higher shear, the system, if it's able to slip, it will simply not try to build more stress, but try to absorb this additional amount of shear by uh, uh, approaching the maximum amount of slip. How boring is this? Maximum amount of slip is what I said. It's the one you have full disentanglement of your polymer at the, at the wall. So why is that? Why is that? That is not so difficult. I mean, it's conceptualized. So. Uh, uh, that interfacial layer at the wall in other words, the interaction between the red and the black is a special place. It is a place things, quote unquote, disentanglement, which I, which I haven't said too much. It is when the disengagement between two layers could prematurely occur. In other words, this disentanglement of red from the black will necessarily occur before disengagement could occur in the bulk. It's the bottom line. So the first thing you, might, you necessarily encounter is what slip. So sometimes I joke, I said, Jesus, we, each part of the research we do, we did it in the logical sequence. Now you have to understand slip in order to understand what reaction there could be in the bulk. Well, it turns out that the Mother Nature helps you because slip is the first thing that, that you encounter. Therefore, necessarily, it's the first thing you study. Okay, so. So in absence of understanding the essence of slip, in terms of how much correction it gives you, there's no chance for you to proceed learning how the shear response uh, occurs in the, in the nonlinear way. So I know it's time for me to clarify this point a little further. Which point? The point of linear versus nonlinear. Linear response. Typically, if you got nine, it's smaller than one. Or you may even wish to say much smaller than one, but usually smaller than one is good enough. Uh, and I hope you understand why. I hope you understand why you have linear response, because remember WI is nothing but tau dW by dt. The time it takes to make 100% deformation, if, it's, if it takes time longer than tau, then your molecules are happily diffusing around. They don't care you are sharing. So the structure is preserved, therefore you have no problem. Structure. That's what it means conceptually by linear response. Yeah. There's another di di uh, uh, condition that you have linear response. You have WI larger than one, but you do your strength so, so little. For example, 50%. That would be linear response because even though you shear them elastically, meaning strongly, but you only moved half H to the right. The molecule only has a little distortion. So it turns out, we'll say a lot more, it turns out it's not enough to destroy the structure, right? So when the strain is low, again, you preserve the structure. It's not too late for me to clarify linear response versus nonlinear response, but this is certainly the perfect time to do it. So nonlinear response, of course, necessarily involves And of course, involves gamma being large. It turns out how large you need to be. Well, just to be fair, around two is enough. It, it, as I will show you later, enough to be large. Uh, so, what do I mean by this? Give you nonlinear response. Remember, in my notation, I was careful. Any time I speak of W I, 
assuming there is always the possibility of Wozniak. Any time I use the word WI, I am mandated to be a bot. Okay, the, 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 the shear rate inside your sample. Whatever slip has done, whatever. Uh, so this is why I claim that at stick slip transition, your bulk is essentially sheared around them. around 100% or less. Therefore, it's all the same word. You only respond in a bulk, and in a bound, you can make a number of words here. So, so you can see up to that point where slip can take place fully, you still have not touched, you still have not dry, driven the bulk undergo nonlinear response. That's the question. You, you have not because I have just indicated that to you. So this is what makes it useful uh, to discuss to, 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 no, the whole session of, uh, of when it starts to become So you, you were keenly aware that in order to deal with, uh, in order to examine whether your polymer, dear polymer, uh, how it would respond under nonlinear conditions, therefore bulk shear rate being higher, you have to you have to exceed the minimum amount of shear, which is computable. Computable, provided you know what is your maximum heat. And this is why I was in a hurry telling you what is maximum B. I give you the example of maximum B. Of course, conceptually, it's just corresponding to full disentanglement. So that the eta one on the denominator is, is a case where you have no longer entanglement, so it becomes very small. I give you a case for melt, and the book has the, also the case of solution, and the paper I, over the weekend, sent to you guys for your leisure, for you to read, uh, further argued uh, strongly that it turns out when you have the solution, the eta one in the denominator is that of the solvent. So it's always going to be the, the, the minimum. So in the case of solution, this eta one Typical. So uh, even though we don't have a uh, detailed theory worked out, the phenomenology of wall slip is fairly clear. In part, as I said, the reason it's fairly clear is we know the phenomenon is localized at the wall. We already know where the disaster is. And it's just about a matter of uh, understanding the degree that this disaster can occur degree of disentanglement. Okay, questions on this? Yeah. The time to make 100% deformation. The time to make one H to the right when your gap is one H. X being H. I never want you to forget it because that's the true meaning of Weissman method. Because it turns out T1, the time to make 100% deformation, it just happened to be the shear rate that you imposed. Remember, this has the big assumption that you shear is what? Someone help me? It's homogeneous. Yeah? Otherwise, uh, this number will mean very little. So we pray to God that this happens. I, I really mean it. 
believe in God or not, you better pray to him. We'll come to that many, many times in the future. Okay? So this is what I call both convenient and necessary for sheer reality to proceed. This is not true. We'll have a total will be in chaos. We wouldn't be able to know how to, 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 to describe the sheer response. So I'm just keep reminding you what to come in the future. Okay. Uh, so I, I think I spent uh, extra time just wanting to make sure that uh, that I, I'm doing all this uh, uh, with a purpose. To set the stage for a tiny part, so of course uh, we had uh, uh, the 6.3, it's about interfacial, interfacial yielding, which is uh, watching how slip occurs from, from no slip to slip. Uh, last time we Time we, we play that movie, right? So I still have to tell you this part is so slow. Uh, so basically, interfacial, interfacial. In other words, it, it, it doesn't occur right away. I, I last time remember showing you a, a bunch of plots. Initially it was shared, and then of course, uh, of course you have seen, you have seen this movie, right? Last time. Uh, what, and, uh, did I, I think I may even have shown you this movie, right? I think I have, right? With the ones that, uh, One that uh, uh, I think I have shown you is called the, the delays, uh, which will come much later, not even in this chapter. But the notion is very clear that there is a failure at the surface. Uh, the only thing I warn you so far with regard to movies like this is, is the following, which is quite important for you to recognize. The, uh, the, the war slip we have been talking about the word slip we have been talking about very clearly. Uh, I know it, the, the microphone is just not very loud. So. Uh, the word slip we have been talking about. Uh, with, uh, the side. Sorry. Is uh, take a look. It strictly suggests to involve a monolayer, right? That that little thickness. A little sickness of uh, uh, I have it here. I have it here somewhere. Hmm? I thought I just wrote it somewhere. Oh, it was I did it in that PPT. So this is strictly was talking about a monolayer, okay? This movie that you guys have started to see uh, cannot claim to have resolved that monolayer. In other words, I cannot claim that this happening only involving a monolayer. But it turns out whatever you have learned about wall slip will tell you that if this movie involves a thousand monolayers, in other words, the first 1,000 layer, monolayers, which is tiny, 1,000 times 10 nanometer is still, uh, is still uh, uh, you know, my, you know, uh, 10 microns. Uh, the magnitude of the wall slip will change by a factor of 1,000, right? 
if, if instead of one, it's the same story here. If this thing changed by a factor of 100, B will change by a factor of 100. Which means it's crucial for you to know what is B involving just one monolayer. If you can quantify that, then you know in experiment, if you observe a B much larger, then you know it's no longer a, a monolayer of a wall slip. And we no longer call that wall slip, we call that apparent slip. Or we may even start to call that shear bending. Okay? So uh, this, this uh, it's just a, uh, something to, to keep in mind. So, so we had, uh, we had a, a notion of what is uh, uh, interfacial uh, yielding. It, uh, it is initially was not slipping and then at some point it started to fail. Uh, there are a bunch of details that I plan to skip uh, just for the sake of time. Uh, this chapter, of course, uh, as I said, is a, a, a notebook has devoted a chapter on wall slip. So it's fairly comprehensive, that was the intention. But I, I don't need to be very compre uh, uh, detailed uh, in, in, in our course to describe everything. So there was just one thing that I uh, want to amuse you with. Uh, any part you, you, you want to know about wall slip, much of it is, is written here, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, this uh, individual yielding, just I, conceptually, I just want you to recall the name, right? That movie, I think, as I indicated, is available on the uh, Wiley website. Uh, uh, there is a place uh, where you can find it. So I'm not going to repeat that. So that movie is uh, giving you the essence of wall slip being absent to emerging. And that, of course, is uh, the, if you like, that interfacial interaction was elastically, uh, what the structure was intact until a slip occurs. So, so yielding satisfy everything we're saying. Elastic to non-elastic, which means the structure is breaking apart. That's why it turns non-elastic. Structure breaking apart, meaning the interfacial disentangled. So we went through all that. So I just want to, before we leave uh, wall slip, I just want to describe one lesson, which was quite uh, amusing. So this is discussed in here, in, in, in this, this session. And it has to do with the following. That since you have slip, Since you have slip, the shear rate in the bulk is much smaller than the actual shear rate your experimentalist would be unaware of if you didn't observe it. In other words, if you don't have a camera to watch it, you just thought your shear rate is H, is V over H. Of course, that's what all you know. But in reality, if there's a slip, I just showed you, it would be, uh, the bulk shear rate will be in the red, not in the blue, yeah? And it's of course smaller because there's slip. And in fact, we had the formula that this is nothing but one over just want to show you which equation was that. So that's equation 6.4b. And similarly, by the same notion I showed you last time, that you would tend to measure a viscosity I argue that would be, by definition, it will be given instead of by instead of being able to measure your true viscosity, 
it turns out your viscosity will be uh, uh, underestimated by the amount that I mathematically derived here because of slip. Of course, when B is much smaller than H, you can see the denominator is nothing but one. And what fooled me until I wrote, start to write the book is this H dependence. So in the literature, it didn't just fool me, in the literature, we always thought that if I make a measurement, you know, you close your eyes, you let the uh, 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 instrument uh, tell you what is the stress, and you let the instrument tell you what is the shear rate, of course it's this, and you get a viscosity, okay? And according to this expression, hmm, it should be H dependent, yeah? In other words, according to this expression. So, so there was a, a rule of thumb, there was a convention, hey, instead of peeking into it, which is so hard to do, typically, one millimeter, you have to have a setup, I will describe that later, uh, it's difficult to do, so let me be cheap. I will just vary my gap and see if my result depends on the gap, okay? The notion there was incorrectly it really amused me, was to assume that this B, as I vary the gap, will not change. Then there will be a gap H dependence, okay, by definition. Uh, so, uh, uh, um, so, so you can proceed. This, uh, this expression, of course, is universal. Uh, suppose I double my gap. I change from H to 2H, okay? By keeping V over H the same. What, what will happen? Uh, according to this expression, if B doesn't change, H doubled, so this quantity becomes smaller, and therefore, this whole quantity becomes larger. So the shear rate will be larger, yeah? Guys, I don't want to lose you here. I'm going to double my lens, of uh, my gap, okay? Like, as an experimentalist, of course I know I'm not stupid, or I want to uh, measure whether there is an H dependence. Of course I want to double my gap, but I still want to exert the same condition, and the only way I know how to exert the same condition is I keep V over H constant. Yeah? Yeah, get it? So, V over H will stay constant, okay? Let's say B doesn't change, so only H changes. This expression will tell you the only way for this side to go up. Oh, Lord, what is going on? The only way for this whole right-hand side to go up is for gamma to go up, yeah? Am I losing you? Okay, we can do it in many other ways, but this maybe looks very uh, abstract, but uh, how, how, can, how, how much simpler can it be? This, as I said, this expression will never be untrue. I just made the argument. I, I tried to be pedag uh, pedagogical, but I didn't succeed, it looked like. 
if B doesn't change when I change H, then when I double the H, this term becomes smaller, and therefore this whole term becomes larger, yeah? And look on the left side. If the denominator doesn't change, it means gamma will become larger, yeah? And then you should recall your system will try to avoid building up the gamma. Yes? Yes? So here comes the magic, which I was very surprised to, to, to discover. Okay, so you can think in a different way. Look only at the middle figure, the figure in the figure in the middle. Okay, my primitive understanding previously was, hey, I'm doubling my gap, so I better double my velocity, right? Remember, I'm drawing a case where I block half of this. The right figure, half of that is a one H, H equals one gap. It has involved a little Vs. I draw the, the, the eta there, uh, the, the gamma dot there, and so on and so forth. But now I double my gap, so H become two H, V become two V, okay? If the surface still involves the same Vs, if it still involves the same Vs, which down me, or I, that's what I thought it was, then by definition, the bulk shear rate will be high. I'm doing it pictorially. You can, of course, prove it mathematically. But I just reminded you the material, until you reach maximum slip, it will avoid doing it. Yeah? So, how do I preserve, how do I avoid having bulk shear rate being higher? Oh, my slip velocity also doubles. <laughs> because I haven't reached Vs max yet. So what does this mean? If I can extrapolate, this B will be twice of that B. <laughs> By definition. And 2B over 2H will be the same as 1B over 1H. In other words, as I increase my H, my B also proportionally increase. It's just magic. I mean, I just, I mean, it's all completely understandable. So this is one of the magic case where you double your uh, velocity. The system says, oh God, I have to slip more. Which is very weird because I'm keeping V over H the same. Yet my system is responding by having a higher slip velocity or something. Think about it, it's mind boggling. I didn't change my shearing condition, but actually you did. Because your shearing condition, V over H, is not dictating how the system is doing. Right? So the system is adjusting to that and realizing, Jesus, you are actually giving me a higher amount of shear that I don't wish to have. And it says, oh, why don't you slip a little more? The bulk tells the interface, and it does so. Okay. So, uh, I was not clever to figure this out. We went ahead and did experiment, as I just told you. We had a system that we suspect of slip, where we're too lazy to put a little 
a movie to show that it was slim. So I told my student, oh, let's just change the gap. And he come back, here we are. He come back, he says, no matter what gap I change, it has the same value for the, for the measurement. Okay? <laughs> In fact, this is the, one of the very regrettable result that I ha was never published. So, what's fine, we were writing the book, so I put it in there. So, we were actually uh, not as clever as we should have been, not appreciative of the nature of what slip. And it's this experimental result, unexpected, forced us to, 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 to think about what what slip is all about. Okay? So, when you change, you can see it, this is changed by a factor of two, okay? And a factor of two on our scale would be this much, okay? So it's way beyond experimental error that, that there was little gap dependence. Question? Oh, this figure, yes, yes, I, 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 yeah, yeah, I, 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 I uh, uh, this figure is, uh, is quite a, a matter of uh, doing a startup, right? So you're basically velocity or sampling starts, and you're watching, you're, wa oh, Lord. you're watching the stress, and you watch stress in the sense of dividing this by a, a V over H, which you know, okay? And then the, uh, uh, it was done at several different V over H's. Three different V over H's. For each V over H, uh, the student changed the gap. And of course, uh, you, you, you're right to ask me this question because this data should look uh, somewhat unfamiliar to you, uh, other than the fact that uh, uh, I guess we, in order to blow it up, so I didn't, we didn't have, well, you know, at log scale, there's no zero. I mean, we cannot accommodate zero. But for him to show this feature, he used log scale. So basically, stress starts, stress starts from zero, which you cannot do on log scale, and then it monotonically grows. And remember, uh, this may be a, 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 what I call a yield point. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what what happens to the to the to the, to the instrument basically. So, so this these are the point where uh, we have yet to discuss in detail the transcend. So forget about transcend. I was asking just pay attention to the steady state. The so-called steady state in reality just means when it's no longer time dependent. Okay, your measurement stress response is already is no longer time dependent. So in that steady state, you find that uh, no matter what is the gap, the result is the same, okay? And that directly, so, uh, this is nothing but eta A, except it's transcend, so we had a little plus there. So, but, but according to our discussion, uh, for, the only way for this to be not H-dependent is for B proportional to H, which is what I have just demonstrated to you why it's possible, because you try to avoid stress to build up. So they end up having the same stress level. That's the other point, okay? For the different gap, it achieved the same stress level uh, because that's the uh, that's the uh, that's what Mother Nature uh, chooses. Okay. Yeah. The good point. So so uh, let me rephrase that logic. If there's no slip, okay then, of course, your result is sort of independent of the gap. Uh, I, I, I may even mention that 
uh, in a parallel plate geometry, usually our edge is half a millimeter to 1.5 millimeter in reality, in reometry. Uh, uh, when it's smaller than half a millimeter, maybe because of alignment, maybe because of some other reasons, we typically find some gap dependence, which I have never had enough resources for my student to investigate why is that. I once did a calculation that if there's misalignment, uh, not being vertical, which I uh, could give you that, but uh, I think I'm trying to answer the question directly, that H, if you are staying above half a millimeter, you are safe. And of course, uh, you cannot be too big, right? Because then you become a cylinder. So, yeah, so, Okay, anything else? So this is just a, uh, as I, uh, it's just an indication of, uh, of typically how we are all lazy enough not to push uh, uh, for the last mile. Uh, so it's a big uh, uh, lesson in some sense. Uh, I am not going to bore you with the rest of the detail. Uh, for example, uh, it turns out you can uh, examine the scenario with a DNA. Our synthetic polymers are too small. But when we use a DNA mimicking the entanglement, DNA is nothing but a linear chain. Semi-flexible, but long enough, it can be completely flexible. And they form entanglement. And the DNA can be uh, uh, so large that you can see it. So on page 132 or 33, I'm not going to spend time on it. We, we even molecularly image the DNA. And watching that DNA stretch at the surface to pull out from the rest of the DNA in the bottom. And uh, once it freed themselves from the bulk, some of the DNA can even tumble. So there are things that, that, that in theory, uh, the, the logic was to really ask yourself, uh, can you see it at a molecular level? And the short answer is yes. And of course, in principle, one can do simulation to demonstrate this motion. Uh, yeah, speaking of simulation, I still don't recall a great deal of simulations on this, uh, which uh, to me, I mean, we could have, been, have done this. I, 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 I'm unable to answer your, the question why, why it was not uh, uh, routinely demonstrated how slip occurs in terms of how the red chain disengage from the black chain. I, I, each time I talk about it, I, I wonder why we have not done it. My, my, my graduating student who graduated should, should have done it that long ago. So, well, I guess we only have 24 hours a day is probably the answer. But, uh, so let's, let's move on. Uh, let's move on to chapter, chapter uh, seven. So we bar barely started. And we're going to, for the moment, forget about chapter six. So we're going to talk only in the limit of no was slip for now. I will, of course, uh, indicate, well, since we are going to speak about data, actually, I will indicate how we did this. We choose our system so that B of H How do we do that? Precisely. And we, by the way, the, the part I avoided talking to you, as I indicate to you, if you have an idea, uh, you will change how we do rheology. Today, no rheometer can safely handle polymer melt. Because uh, I, in, I think I already indicated once, if you have a parallel plate, corn plate, this meniscus become unstable and go nasty. 
not supposedly known as edge fracture or whatnot, supposedly related to the second normal force being large, and so on and so forth, uh, which is also model dependent. So the true nature of that is irrelevant in the sense we know uh, empirically things go crazy as you start to shear and melt like this. So, which means it's impossible for you to learn about rheology in the shear mode. That would be, uh, uh, that would be very, very, very uh, unfortunate. So the way we do it, we do solution. So when you have a solution, it turns out you can make your solution much softer. It turns out your modulus can be softer than that of the pure. by a factor given here, okay? So when you choose your solution to be only 10%, you bring down the stress level, which is dictated by the modulus, by a factor of over 100, okay? So that it's much softer, so that uh, normal force becomes small, so that the edge can be uh, treated as, as uh, being uh, edge fracture free. And there are different uh, uh, ways to, 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 to discuss this. I will, I will omit this part for now, that there will be no edge fracture problem. The only way you avoid having edge fracture problem is you deal with solutions and Moreover, you, uh, it means that you, it means that your, uh, know your maximum B is calculatable by knowing what is your bulk viscosity and by knowing what is your solvent viscosity. So the way to kill B, to make it small, as you can see, conceivably, is to bring up beta s. And the way we build up, we uh, 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 minimize b, is put your polymer in a solvent that is also made of the same chain except lower molecule. So you can arbitrarily tune it so that you can have a gigantic solvent viscosity to make B smaller. So for now, I, I, I think I made, this is why the wall slip was so necessary because in discussing chapter seven, you need to claim that there's no slip. And you cannot claim unless you have a quantitative understanding of the characteristics of what slip, which we do now by, by reviewing chapter six. So we're gonna uh, 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 concentrate on a, uh, in the limit where slip is unimportant. Um, if you haven't had enough slip, no, go through the entire chapter six, there's plenty discussed about, uh, about uh, the challenge to avoid slip. Is to give you a simple example. If you, uh, like DNA, okay? Uh, many of the data we had on slip that I showed you uh, involve DNA solutions. DNA in uh, aqueous uh, uh, solution, basically DNA in water, and water has a viscosity, as you know, that's a unit. So it's very inviscous. So this tend to give you a big B, okay? So I just want to cover my ground. So in the case of water solutions, uh, if you have high entanglement, it's very hard for you to avoid having a lot of slip. So the rest, we're going to talk about a case where uh, you manage to uh, 
take care of the effect of sleep and able, as I prescribed here, able to start to reach nonlinear region. Nonlinear, as I uh, already carefully defined, that the bulk start to be sheared strongly. So, uh, chapter seven, in that sense, uh, is occupying sort of a, a central uh, place in, in the book. And, uh, uh, and uh, let's just, uh, just follow it somewhat, and uh, uh, I start with something very gentle in, chapter, uh, in the first section. I want to deal with so-called uh, voluntary yielding. And that's nothing but writing the numbers model again. And, uh, and that, by definition, uh, means you are discussing steady state. And by definition, done in the condition of zero requirement. So these are the two topics uh, in this little section. The voluntary yielding is something I have mentioned already once before, so let me just amplify it. Chapter six or uh, seven is all about startup deformation. But it's going to talk about startup shear as well as startup extension. And we will start with shear. So you have this, and you are watching the stress response. We had a sufficient discussion about fact, the, star, the stress always starts from zero, from zero. And if it is sheared very weakly, remember we call this linear response, then uh, you should still notice a feature that something happens around the red line. And that point, you may guess, occurs around tau, okay? So when time is much shorter than tau, no molecules can move around. Therefore, I want to emphasize one point, the initial elastic response occurs regardless of the value of Wi. So even for Wi is smaller than one, you can manage to, uh, to cause elastic response because as long as the time is short enough, it has no chance to uh, break up the structure. And so I cannot say it more clearly, it starts to break up voluntarily with diffusion. on its own. That's why I call it un voluntary, or unforced, to be another word. It still yields. No. This is still yield. The indication of yield. Agreeable to you? the dictionary, that's what it is. You have flow and elastic deformation. Flow being the theory part of the flow. It does that. Even under the condition, a boring condition of WI small to one, which of course it's so uh, 
so little need to be talked about because our processing never involves such a slow rate. But uh, it's useful to bring it uh, with the same language that we are using for high shift. So uh, that's that. That's the concept uh, 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 of uh, voluntary yield. The shear thinning I already told you many times before. Uh, uh, except in the book, uh, I uh, I give you two different ways. So remember this point roughly sh for monodis, for example, the thing should occur around inverse of tau, which is the same to say it's tau less than or equal to one, and if you are uh, dealing with polities, for example, you will find the better concept is to think about your stress. I know it's unfamiliar for you. Like Alex, you took biology before. Viscosity commonly as a function of rate gives you shear thinning. There's another notion much more powerful, especially for dealing with polities, for example. Is viscosity plotted instead of shear rate plotted as shear stress. Okay? And when you do that, it plunges around a, a, a level which is a plateau matrix. In other words, with respect to stress, the thinning is much stronger. I'm not doing anything fancy, meaning they are. Keep in mind, steady state. That's the only place you can speak about, for me to speak about viscosity and to speak about shear thinning. So this is all steady state. Uh, uh, in steady state, I don't want to forget what I was trying to say, but of course, Everything is well defined. The viscosity is well defined. The stress is well defined. In steady state, it's well defined. In any other case, it's not well defined because look at here, this figure. The stress is, 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 uh, is keep changing still. Right? So, of course, you don't have a unique way to speak about stress. And this is why you want to speak about steady state. Okay. I, I want to get this uh, kind of common aspect out of the way first. Shear thinning is, of course, how I learned rheology. And uh, uh, people were always fascinated by this non-Newtonian behavior, that how come viscosity becomes smaller as I shear high, faster and faster. Uh, that's all just steady state. In other words, uh, what about the transcend? What about when you first start? Well, I told you about uh, uh, one case when WI is smaller than one. What about, uh, how do I get out of this? Hmm. Clear the image. So I just want to, no, I just want to finish up and, and indicate that, uh, that nothing better than what I, uh, to draw than, than what I can draw here. So I also want to indicate the middle figure. Uh, the purple is what we just discussed, the WI is smaller than one, the linear response, the unforced yielding. Phenomenologically, when you do start up watching the stress response, you will find it start from zero. Look in the middle figure, B, right? Start from zero, it climbs up like a linear, like a elastic response. And at some point, it gives in. In other words, 
your material's ability to further resist the deformation, to resist further deformation. Uh, that's the right word. It, it start to resist less as you draw further, as you, as you shear further. Because the force I sense, all of a sudden I see it's getting smaller now. That's the peak. Getting smaller and eventually we just steady state, as the middle figures show. And of course, this is famously known since the four or five decades now, more like six decades now, uh, known as overshoot. And this overshoot. What does that mean? Well, if I, you know how to handle it. This is clearly indication of yield, pure. Elastic response, flow, and something is connecting to give you this, to show this transition. So it's a transition from elastic response to flow, flow in the sense of steady state, in the sense the stress no longer changing, right? Steady state, remember, it means your response is kind of independent of. And the only thing material that can do this is when material is in a flow state, okay? So you definitely will have a flow state if you manage to do that. And you definitely have the initial part being elastic uh, uh, responding innocently. And somewhere in between, the structure falls apart. And instead of the structure falling apart voluntarily at power level, what I just indicated to you, instead of occurring at power level, it may occur at a much earlier time indicating somehow you have destroyed the structure by force, by having sheared so much. Okay. So this part, this much is uh, no brainer. This should be totally clear. Is it not clear to you? Elastic structure responsible for what you observe initially, the linear, uh, the elastic response, fail to proceed to 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 to, to survive. And mechanically, it, it also means you would start to give in. You know, it, I says, "Oh, you shear me now, I give up. I, I don't resist. I can't. You are breaking me apart." Uh, This is the actual data. So the middle was a, a, a sketch of uh, this generic feature, and the left, uh, and, the, and the last figure on the right is the actual data. What you observe is at this point it's moving to higher and higher strength as you lose higher and higher weight. So this uh, included the case where it's not going the other one is actually going to cross it. It's no bigger than one. And this, uh, this overshoot builds up more strongly as you can see. And there are even additional complications. But we are never going to bother uh, talking about them in, 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 in this chapter. So that's the stress response. If you divide that stress by shear rate, of course, you get this response. And since this is occurring with a higher viscosity, so when you divide, it turns out you, 
when you divide your stress by the higher shear rate, turns out your uh, viscosity stays below the linear response response, which is a key feature that I uh, that will come back to it again and again. In simple shear, when you demand to plot your data in terms of so-called viscosity. Uh, to me, viscosity is only meaningful in steady state. Nothing prevents you from making this definition. This is the definition of viscosity. Stress divided by shear. Nothing prevents you from making this plot. The question is your meaning of it, right? How, have you heard about a viscosity that climbed from zero to a maximum? That's of course nonsense. If I may say so, allow me. Or tie with what we said before, that why stress always starts from zero. We can say, oh, the sample initially is not flowing. Therefore, viscosity is zero. So there are multiple ways you can sort of say similar thing. This is viscosity at the end of the day. And of course, this is nothing but shear thinning. Steady state, the higher rate one has a lower viscosity. Moreover, the higher rate one in this so called transient viscosity will always be under the envelope. I think I failed to, to add a plus here. This could be like a typo. We should have eta plus. Uh, so this is something I need you to keep in mind. We, we can discuss this in this notation. Nothing can respond more strongly than in the linear response loop. It's always going to be lower. Uh, the more, the more, uh, the higher the, the the shear rate, the lower. Okay, uh, I think today we will stop here. I see I, I, I reached my point. And next time we will come back and talk about uh, uh, some characteristics about this overshoot. And uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 think, I think this is all I, I need to say today. Okay.